All right, so for uh, week two here in module one, we're going to look at the first module um, that is part of this overall program. Before I jump into that, you guys should be able to see the meeting link. Obviously, the ones in here have found that. If you're able to attend, great. Um, there will be this playlist. It'll be the easiest way to get all the videos. If you want to subscribe, et cetera, you're welcome to do that. Please note that any of the older playlists or semesters or anything else related to this class would not be valid this year as we are using the new content within the course. And that's all going to be pointing to there. It's mostly there for historical purposes. I don't want to remove it on that side. Um, big thing that I added here the other day is the PDF copy of this. Um, make sure you grab this. It'll be the full ebook um, until they get me the deep links, which they should have this week. Um, you're welcome to use this PDF, et cetera, for the purposes of reading and going through there. Um, once they get me those deep links, which again, I've been told it will be hopefully this week or absolutely will be this week. Um, you guys will get access to the book. You'll get access to the labs, the exam prep and the exam voucher all in that same section. All right. So for this week and week two, um, it'll mostly be reading through module one. So you want to read through in that PDF um, module one. And then today we're just going to kind of cover the PowerPoint um, slides that are associated with that. So in this one um, is some of the main objectives they're trying to cover the TCP IP model, the OSI model. This is basically a recap of all of your inner networking one, two courses that you may have gone through or should have gone through by now as well as a recap on Windows and Linux in general, not where topologies, a bunch of different topics in between there. So computer network, um, most of the time we've always had a network operation center that was common. So as the event of PCs came out and businesses got larger and larger, we would end up with NOx. And typically you see NOx um, at the ISP level or a very large company that has a bunch of remote sites that NOC has the responsibility of monitoring all the services and, and traffic that goes across the network, um, making sure that they don't have any issues or alarms or fiber cuts and things like that they can test for. When a SOC came along, a SOC is really doing the same thing, only they're looking for threats against the network itself, both external threats as well as internal threats, with internal threats being the highest priority, um, as that's where a vast majority of this stuff would come from. So the basics of that SOC require the understanding of computers and architecture as a whole. Um, on the computer networking basics here is just the networks involved in interconnected systems, et cetera. Um, you'll see some overlap as we talked about between the two. Um, most of the motivations on the computer networks are these networks facilitating communication, resource sharing, collaboration, et cetera. Um, mobile has been a huge impact on people bringing it into the network and an influencing of how you're going to do the network architecture. When it comes to the security side of things, it's even worse because now you can't guarantee that they're always on your network, always being monitored and scanned. Um, we're going to have the same things with home networking and IoT um, and the social implications that go along with that. So I'm going to kind of scroll through here because what I really want to do is do a quick recap on the TCP IP model. So remember your base model is gonna be the OSI model, right? This is your seven layers that go through there, working from the bottom up. Your TCP model is a small chunk of that, particularly related to the TCP IP. So if you, again, you're working your way up with four relating to the link, um, and then your three into the internet layer, two into transport, one into application. And so be position below that is going to be your transport layer. It ensures your end-to-end -end communication. That's why we're using TCP. Uh, UDP would be faster but less reliable. However, a lot of services are starting to use UDP with additional features that increase the reliability, but also maintain that speed that's associated with that as well. When you're dealing with the TCP link, you have the three-way handshake, which means we have to send a packet to the end, comes back to us, we send a packet back. That ensures that we have a good handshake and authentication between the two. And that helps with reliability in terms of resending packets that don't arrive on the far side. With UDP, it's best effort. 
Um, think of it like UPS trying to deliver your package and drop kicking it along the way. It may make it there, may, may not make it there. Um, and there's no chance of them resending it for free. Have they gone through the, the fundamental architecture for computers and over 50 years has served the cornerstone of networking? This is this TCP IP model um, and it's positioned below the application layer in the main TCP or the OSI model. So again, seven is gonna deal with your physical link and this is going to be the wire or the wireless or whatever technology you're using under the hood. As we work our way up into the networking side, this is where you're going to get into the IP and your uh, just above your physical layer and the data link layer. You have your transport layer, session, presentation, and application. Um, these are going to work in conjunction with that other, one another. You should remember this from your uh, Inner Networking 1 class. And of course, as a sender, we package it up starting with the application layer, wrap it all the way down to the physical layer, in which case we then send it off to the receiver. And then they unpackage it and unwind it on the far side. The main reason that we go back through this is just to remind you of the different layers and where they come through. Um, from our side, when you get into the SOC side, you have to remember how things should be working so that you can alert yourself to the anomaly that's happening. And typically we will be using exploits in order to, in the vulnerability, so to speak, within this model. For example, in that TCP IP model, we send a bunch of send packets. That's that part of that three-way handshake. And we constantly send them. Then we can make sure that that receiver is constantly trying to address our concerns of a send packet or an ACK packet. If they're doing that kind of thing, it can tie up services and cause denial of services, et cetera. So some of the features built into these models are the same things that can also tear them down. All right, so different type of networks. Uh, most of us are familiar with this client server model, and this is typically what you would see out in industry. You do have the peer-to-peer -peer model. Most of you have seen this in the, the realm of fire, uh, file sharing, et cetera, out on the internet. Um, you could also see this with like the Tor network, et cetera, um, as a means to doing private VPN access across different things. Um, other networks that you can go through there, we also have a personal area network or a PAN, a local area network, a wireless local area network, metropolitan area, and a wide area. And so your PAN is going to be very, very simple, very, very close. Smallest coverage, this is going to be something like your computer to a monitor, mouse, keyboard, and even a mobile phone, things within the vicinity. Within a LAN, you're going to have something that geographically looks like a computer within an office building, wired network, printers, fax machine, et cetera. And a wireless network, most of you all have these at your homes now. It's pretty commonplace. Um, and you're going to pull up things like security cameras, which I hope you never use wireless security cameras, especially by the end of this class. Um, and then all the other devices that you're going to see available that typically connect to your wireless side. Um, on types of networks, you also have a MAN, which usually spans over a city. Um, good example of this would be like a local utility that has multiple buildings across the, uh, the city itself. And so you'll have these LANs individually, and they'll go across a MAN. This MAN is kind of like a private cloud, meaning it's not necessarily connecting over the internet. It's more connecting over fiber trunks or links that go between these different places. They could also be using wireless backhaul transmission. And then last but not least is our WAN that covers over a large area, um, typically connecting multiple LANs across the way. One other communication we talk about our network is going to be on the SAN side. And most of you at this point um, in the undergrad program haven't seen much of a SAN unless you were uh, taking uh, John's uh, VMware course, as that's the first place that uh, SAN was introduced. Um, SANs are widely popular in the server network. Um, it can also be popular now in the desktop network, as you see up here. And it's a way to access high-speed storage. Um, typically, this is not done over the same link, meaning this is usually a separate NIC in the machine that's then tied back to a SAN environment. Um, they say here they have features like fiber channel, et cetera. Most of what you see today is going to be like through an NFS share, a network file storage system. Um, you may see things like iSCSI, blockage, um, et cetera. 
those are a way to get block level storage. I won't go into great detail, um, but the idea here with most SANs is they have to be high speed networks. And by high speed these days, it's typically 10 gig or higher. Um, you're gonna see 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig networks for most of the SAN storage. All right, anybody have any questions over the network recap? Yeah, most of this should be a recap from your inner networking stuff. It's mostly just getting you back into the, the foundation type of stuff before we jump into the, the really nitty gritty stuff. So in network topologies, we have those arrangements. You guys have seen the different styles here before. So we have the old school bus topology. This is typically where there's one communication bus. Um, it's simplistic, it's cost effective, but limited scale and a single point of failure. We don't really see too much of those anymore. Um, that's typically literally the old bus where we would have a cable running through a uh, building um, and it is a single cable used to be coax and we would use vampire clips to attach to that and then out to the PCs and we would wait for somebody to send packets along the wire. This is not the, the cat five side. Um, the next style was ring topology, which took that same concept, but instead created a ring so that if any one of these links was broken, it could then send the traffic around the other side. And so this was usually token ring style communication where you had a token that trafficked across. And once it hit the PC, it was destined for it would stop there. However, as usual, those are... Um, lots of issues that can go through there, um, but it doesn't scale very well, right? You have to have this massive cable going throughout the building. And so that brought us to our star topologies. And this is where we would have a central hub or a switch that offers some kind of centralized management and scalability, but it depends on that central hub and requires much more cabling as each independent PC is connected. Um, most of you, I hope, know the difference between a hub and a switch. So a hub is when packets are gonna come in and then get sent out to every single port on this side, um, which means we can easily sniff and see traffic of other computers. So um, the bad part is, is our PCs have to ignore that traffic if we're on a hub. Um, if you are a threat actor, that is a great way for you to be able to capture traffic going across the network. Today, we don't really see too many hubs. Almost everything is a switch. And so in a switch, we are tying those MAC addresses into the um, address table or the CAM table. Um, and from there, if I send a packet from this PC wanting to go over to this PC, I have a MAC address table in here that tells me exactly what port that should go out. And therefore, none of these PCs see any traffic except what's destined from here to here. Um, we do have uh, some mesh topologies out there as now. They offer some redundancy and some scalability. Um, it is complex and it's very costly to do that. So a lot of times what you'll see this mesh is going to be like in a network core um, where you have redundancy between uplinks for the core switches as well as redundancy even between multiple ISPs um, and then down to your link layer too. However, it's very costly. You got to have multiple switches, basically double of everything. And half the time, um, they're not really being utilized. Um, they could be in an HA failover, um, or they could just be load balancing traffic, um, hopefully between them so that you actually get some use out of that equipment. You may also see a tree topology it allows for some easy expansion, but depending on the backbone can be a little more complex. And then on the hybrid side, you're gonna see combinations of this. So for example, here you can see a bus and a tree type mesh. All right, um, when we get down to the end, you see a full mesh going through here. Um, it offers obviously maximum redundancy is extremely expensive and complex to install and maintain. Um, a lot of this would be only in very, very high-end systems where you need to make sure you have extremely high reliability and uptime. And with a full mesh, that means every single device is um, connected to every other device in that network. So um, gets a little expensive as you try to work through there. All right, practical example of choosing which type of topology you're gonna do, for example, in a small medium business or SMB considers that scalability, fault tolerance and cost effectiveness. Um, you would see stuff like STARS, which are a practical example, offering scalability, fault tolerance, and centralized management. 
Um, again, this is the most common that we see here today. You could do a mesh, which provides even more fault tolerance and scalability, but it's a little complex and costly, and then a full hybrid, in which case you would have a star subnet that suggests that's suitable for a SMB, meeting requirements for scalability, fault tolerance, and cost effectiveness. Anybody got any questions on network topologies? So at this point, you guys should be able to draw topologies on the fly. And so when you are working in a SOC or even a, a help desk or a support center and the roles that you would get with the kind of uh, job skills that would come out of this class, you should be able to visualize this in your head. So you want to build out this topology in your head, have a scratch piece of paper, be able to write it out. Because as you're troubleshooting PCs, it's imperative that you have some kind of visual diagram in order to chase that out. And then you can start to use the troubleshooting. In my case, it's a 50-50. You chop everything in half, figure out what works, what doesn't work. You go to the other 50% and keep chopping it in half. Eventually, you'll find the error somewhere along the way. All right. With our network hardware components, um, as we kind of talked about before, we can have things like point-to-point -point networks. This is often uh, used to share like routing between different networks. Um, we could also have broadcast networks, which is a way for us to send the uh, packets out um, to the individual machines. And a lot of that could be multicast. Um, one of the bigger uses for multicast was typically in the IPTV realm. It could also be used for... Uh, uh, transmitting voice or video or data um, as a means of you just have to, you know, it's always going across the link. You just have to decide whether you're going to listen for it or not. Um, multicast is also handy. For example, we use it here in the lab in order to uh, image machines. Um, so if we want to send a image of the hard drive out to multiple machines at once, we can use multicasting. There again, the machines, if they're listening for it, can subscribe. We don't chew up um, even more bandwidth or have more TCP issues going across there. We just broadcast it out. If you're listening, you'll start pulling those packets down. Other things that you might see, um, depending on which connections that go through there, uh, the connection of any two or more networks is termed as an internet. And with the global internet being a well-known example, a PAN or a personal area network enables those devices to communicate within an individual's range, such as Bluetooth connectivity. LANs or local area networks connect devices within a single building and facilitate resource sharing. Um, I would even argue that LANs could even go between buildings um, uh, if it's in the same vicinity or same compound. That would still be classified as a LAN. Um, with wireless LANs being essential in the home environments as well as even corporate. Wired LANs um, typically employ transmission technologies like copper or optical fiber, with Ethernet being widely used and VLANs offering segmentation across there. Fiber is, uh, you know, back in my day when I was going through the networking programs, fiber was kind of like this distant thing you kind of talked about, but it was really only very high use case when you would do it. Nowadays, we're starting to see that. Um, you want the high bandwidth of gig, 10 gig, et cetera, you know, before Cat6 was able to transmit a lot of this. Um, using fiber in those realms was pretty handy. Um, fiber strands themselves have gotten much more reliable than they used to be in the past, um, and you can deploy them in a wide variation. However, wireless LANs are really bumping up there. So if you look at the speeds you can get with uh, Wi-Fi 6E and 7, frankly, you can go faster than most of the copper cables that are out there. And so that's really changed a lot of the, the ways that we set up these different networks and transmit, which means it's vastly going to change on the security side when it's on the wireless. Your metropolitan area networks are going to extend over a city, often exemplified by cable trans uh, television networks, and then your wide area networks, which will use things like VPNs and ISP managed networks. All right, so here again is a uh, connection back to our TCP IP protocol suite. Um, these are the protocols that you'll kind of need to remember. Um, 
on the OSI model, you can again see where these mesh up and how these compete with one another on this side. So again, in the TCP IP model, we call that link, where in the OSI, that would be our data link and physical layer. We have our network layer, internet layer, our transport is the same on both. And then in the application layer of TCP IP is the equivalent of the session presentation and application. Key things that you need to know are the protocols that typically run over TCP. Um, in the old school days, you're going to have the things like token ring I mentioned and Ethernet, frame relay, ATM. These three are pretty much dead. Uh, frame relay, ATM, token ring, they're, they're all but gone. Um, very, very few plays, if any, have any of those services still available. Um, everything, Ethernet kind of won out on that side. Um, at the layer three layer, you have IP, Internet Protocol. At two, you're going to have uh, FTP and DHCP. Um, and then at the one, at the application layer, you'll typically have your HTTP, HTTPS, et cetera, FTP, TFTP, uh, DNS, Telnet, SMTP, and DHCP up here. Right. Um, this is within the TCP IP suite. Obviously, you have some UDP things up here as well. So TFTP, for example, is going to be a UDP type service. Um, you'll also see DNS, which is also a typical UDP type service going through there. All right. So these are ones that you would want to kind of memorize. So your HTTP is your hypertext protocol, operates at the application layers, foundational for all of our web communication, HTTPS being the secure version of that. FTP operates at the application layer, facilitates file transfer between client server supporting FTP and passive SF, um, FTP modes. You're commonly also going to see SFTP here, which is using SSH in order to facilitate that FTP transaction. SMTP is our simple mail transfer protocol. This is used at the application layer, runs on port 25. That's one that most people don't memorize. So HTTP is 80 HTTPS is 443, FTP is 21, SMTP is 25, and then TCP itself is the transmission control protocol. Remember, this is your connection-oriented, reliable communication that has error checking. UDP is a user uh, datagram protocol. It is connectionless and is unreliable, but it's used for real-time applications with low latency. IP, Internet Protocol, again, operates at the Internet layer and handles all of our logistical addressing. Um, we also have ICMP. Typically, what most people will know ICMP for is ping. So if we are going to ping a device to see it's up, we use ICMP packets. And then ARP is used as a way of um, linking the IP address to the MAC address within a LAN. And I was talking about ARP tables or CAM tables uh, earlier. This is the protocol that we would refer back to. All right, so network security controls. Um, these are gonna be measures and mechanisms that are implemented to protect our infrastructure. So some key security controls that we would have um, that we are gonna be using in this class. For example, starting at the upper left here, we're gonna have a WAF, which is a web application firewall. This is used to protect web applications by filtering out and monitoring HTTP traffic that is attempting to prevent common web application attacks. We have a SIME, and we're going to be dealing quite a bit with a SIME. Um, a SIME is used to collect and analyze log data and identify and respond to security incidents, providing centralized monitoring reporting. This is a huge piece of the reason I changed the course material in this class, um, as you had very little introduction in the old Cisco course. And this course, we're going to be heavily working with a few SIMEs so that you guys have this moving out into industry. Um, that was one of the big takeaways for most of the students that were getting jobs coming out of here is they wish they had a little more time. Um, so this course definitely does that. Um, that was some of the big pieces they were asked in interview questions too when they were getting hired. Network encryption uh, secures data in transit using protocols like SSL, TLS, and IPsec. We're going to talk about those. Antivirus and anti-malware solutions are used to detect, prevent, and remove malicious software from network devices. Network segmentation is going to help us divide that network into segments to help restrict lateral movements of threats. 
Um, we'll talk about this as we try to break through networks and how to prevent that. We'll use things like VLANs or even physical segmentation to keep these two apart. Um, if you were in the, the military or DOD spec, they would even call this air gapping, right? Where you would keep two physical set works completely apart and there was no one device that would bridge between those two devices or between those two networks. Our NAC controls the network access base um, on security policy compliance and user authentication, verifying any kind of device security posture. This is our network access control. Our VPNs are there to ensure communication over the internet by encrypting data in transit, allowing remote access to network resources. We're actually gonna play a little bit with VPNs so you guys can do that. I know a lot of you run some of them at your own home. Um, either to get traffic back or some of you may even be using them for the capability of bouncing off and saying you're from a different country um, to access other resources on the internet. IPS or intrusion prevention system is identifying and preventing threats by monitoring that network or even system activities. Um, and it can be either network-based or host-based. And so on a network-based, we call it a NIPS. And on a host-based, we call it a HIPS. Um, so you'll see some of that terminology floating around. And then lastly, firewalls are going to control and monitor network traffic based on security rules with hardware firewalls at network perimeters and software firewalls on each individual device. Um, at this point, most of you are probably going to be taking the firewalls course in the spring if you're a senior. Um, and that's where we really dive into that on the network side. But there's the whole world of the host-based firewall. Uh, most of you know this, like even from Windows Firewall um, and, and being able to turn that off and on and lock things down. On the Linux side, we would typically use something like UFW if we're on a Debian based. Um, and there's a couple other resources we can pull there as well. All right. So we mentioned a couple of these just now, but these are all the kind of network security devices you would need to be familiar with. Um, has any of you guys played with some of these devices before? I haven't. Okay. So again, a firewall, most of you have this on like your home-based router, right? Um, it's a very simple firewall. Typically it's uh, port-based. Um, and then we have what's called next generation based firewalls. That's a little bit of what I teach in the, uh, the firewalls course. I'll actually be teaching you a little bit of both. Um, for example, we'll take you through OpenSense or PFSense. Um, and that's something everybody should kind of deploy on their machine and get a chance to play with. You can use a very old laptop, a very old, uh, anything in order to deploy a firewall, um, and it, it, it's pretty easy and, and nice to get a hold of. And so, and part of this class, um, you definitely want to get your hands on that. If you have my firewalls class in the spring, you'll definitely get hands on. VPNs, again, are your virtual private networks. There's a couple different ways to do that. Again, with the firewalls that we teach you, you can set up a VPN so that you can connect back to your home. Um, when you're on the road, you're at the hotel, et cetera, you're scared to use the hotel internet. And if you're not, you should be. Um, you want to make sure you connect to some VPN and get back to your home site. Um, then route all your traffic back through there. Um, we can also use tools like NordVPN or some of the other services that are out there in order for you to connect to something that's a little more reliable. Um, and some of you, again, may have even seen this to use and act like you're from a different country if you're trying to access other resources. For example, television shows in Japan or... Um, other networks like in Australia, I've seen people use it for it works pretty well. Your network based access controls, this could be anything from a LDAP type server um, that's used to authenticate users across the network. Um, and you could also use um, uh, Active Directory um, is another one that's commonly used there. Intrusion prevention system or an IPS, a lot of times this can be baked into the firewall um, if you have a really high-end firewall. Otherwise, there's a couple different ways of doing intrusion prevention. You also have what's called an IDS, which is your um, intrusion detection system. And so prevention and detection are two different things. 
Um, intrusion prevention systems are meant to prevent anything from ever getting into the network at all. Um, but it can only do that based off things that are registered or already known threats that are out there. Um, sometimes you can do some anomaly testing and such, but intrusion prevention is really about um, already known threats. Intrusion detection is trying to detect those anomalies that are on the network that could be intrusion detect um, intrusions both on the inside and on the outside. Network authentication devices, network segmentation device. This is going to be like your uh, switches, um, layer two, layer three, et cetera. Your DDoS mitigation. Most of you would have seen this with something like Cloudflare. Um, so if you're browsing the internet, every now and then you'll see Cloudflare out there. That's one of the huge DDoS um, utilities that a lot of companies use to mitigate uh, denial of service attacks. Note that the first D is distributed. So this is distributed denial of service attacks. Um, this is the, the story of the botnets that you hear all over the internet working together. So whether it's IP cameras or your refrigerator these days or anything that has a Wi-Fi connection, they could be turned into bots. And when they're all formed together, you could use those to attack uh, different interfaces. And because you're coming from things like a refrigerator, most people don't understand um, that that could, that could actually do some pretty good damage if you get enough of them together. And then our antivirus appliances, this could be something either in the network or even software on the local PCs. A lot of times you'll have uh, signatures that'll be up there and work in detection with your IPS and IDS and preventing things coming across the network. Anybody have any questions on the network side of things here? Okay. Windows security. So, um, you know, Windows itself has a comprehensive suite of utilities designed to pr protect the systems running the Microsoft Windows operating system from various security threats, provides a robust and layered defense across there. Biggest ones you're going to see over the years would have been things like Windows Defender, which does your malware uh, protection, et cetera. Um, you're also going to now see the, the whole update with Windows 10, Windows 11, um, where all of these are kind of built in together and now is just pure Windows security on that side. This includes regular updates, auditing, kind of some advanced threat protections. We're also going to do some threat intelligence in this class that is based around these kind of Windows security sections. So these are gonna be some Windows terms that you guys will need to be familiar with in order for prevention. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with some hacking names, you have black hat, white hat, blue, blue team, red team, et cetera. This course is designed to get you to be the blue team, which means you are preventing attacks from coming into the network. But in order for you to prevent attacks that are coming into the network, you need to know how these guys are actually doing it. So you need to know a little bit of red team to do blue team work. And when you're on the red team, you got to know how blue team is going to use it to try to defend against it. So Windows utilizes these in terms of user authentication. You could have multi-factor authentication. This could be the Windows Hello service. Um, it could be a smart card authentication that goes in the computer, biometrics from fingerprint, um, eyes even, um, iris detection. And then, like I said, the Windows Hello is uh, one of the newer features baked in. On access control, you have the UAC or the user account control. You have file permissions, security groups, even Active Directory security. Um, you see some role-based access systems. So this is going to be whether you're a admin or a system user, et cetera. Um, there are things with dynamic access control that can change as you're using it. And then you have app locker for some of that as well. On the encryption and data protection, this is pretty common more than it ever used to be. You have BitLocker, um, the ability to encrypt the entire file system or lock the drive. Um, as you know, or some of you may have heard when the, uh, the issues here a while back um, with the cybersecurity software that was causing things to crash all over the world. The part of that was because it was stopping Windows from booting. And then in order for them to repair that CrowdStrike, um, in order to fix that, they had to enter in the BitLocker key. 
And if you guys have ever dealt with BitLocker keys, they're very long, complicated keys, and you usually store them on a computer somewhere safe. Um, but if you can't get into the administrator's computer to get the BitLocker keys off to unlock all the remote systems, you, you have a problem. Um, so there was lots of eye openings that's happened here recently with the BitLocker side of things. You have the Windows Information Protection and the Windows Defender Credential Guard. And then over on the malware side, you have the Windows Defender Antivirus. You have Windows Defender Smart Screen. So Smart Screen um, is actually something I've been fighting here recently. So if you ever write any software for um, Microsoft operating systems, you know, compiled to an EXE, you typically have to have that signed with a digital certificate. Um, and there, it's very expensive to get that certificate. It can be anywhere from a couple hundred dollars up to a grand, depending on which level of certificate you need. And there's several different types of those certs that you can get for doing code signing. Um, the idea behind this is if you have not paid for that certification, you are going to get the pop-ups that say this may be an unsecured app, or you may get something that pops up and say, this could be a virus or malware, et cetera. Um, and companies have to go through that and either pay for the high-end cert to validate who they are, or they have to get enough users out there to utilize their software that Microsoft goes, okay, this is legitimate. So it's handy, but it's also hard for developers and costly for developers that are trying to get started out there. You also have the Microsoft Defender on the endpoint, and then you have controlled folder access and Defender offline. One of the main things you guys hopefully have taken is the Windows Client course. And we now have that combined with the Windows Server course. So you guys would get a little more familiar with group policies, but that's one of your best things you can do in the Windows environment in order to keep things consistent and lock users out of things that they shouldn't have access to. So group policy is a central and flexible tool that's used for managing Windows environments enabling those administrators to configure, secure, and control user and computer settings across the domain. Group policy will enforce those security settings, including password policies, account lockouts, user rights assignments, local security policies, audit security baselines, and software restriction policies. Those group policy objects are used for securing, uh, filtering, WMI filtering, and security compliance management through group policy management, which is the GPMC. You guys will get to work a little bit with that management console and the security configuration wizard or the SCW. A well-designed and properly implemented group policy infrastructure is crucial for maintaining a secure, standardized, and efficient Windows environment. I will admit, as much as I dislike being the end user of one of these, as an administrator, it is the only way to stay sane and keep everything consistent across the platform. So they play a vital role in defining, implementing, and enforcing those security settings, contributing significantly to the overall security and stability of the Windows environment. And most of that is just set up so that you don't get users running off and installing random pieces of software that they found on the internet and um, um, that's typically what gets them into trouble. All right. We'll cover the basics of the Unix Linux security. So hopefully most of you have taken the INF 671 course and know a little bit about Linux at this point, but Unix and Linux are renowned for their robust security features with the kernel serving as the core component responsible for the managing uh, system resources. You guys may also know that Windows is slowly moving over to a Linux kernel under the hood um, for this very purpose. And, and, and it's to keep those security features running. The shell itself acts as a command line interface for the user interface, um, interpreting and communicating commands in the kernel while the file system organizes data hierarchically, considering everything as a file. So any processor, any information that comes through, everything is treated like a file in the Linux, Unix operating systems. In the Unix and Linux side, you use a username and password system for authentication, storing user information and configuration files, and uh, those are often in, uh, with encrypted passwords. Both operating systems manage processes uh, with unique process IDs or PIDs, and they'll support multi-user and multitasking environments, employ a robust file permission system 
which will obviously cause lots of headaches if you've ever tried to do it, but it's great. It does its thing and it creates strong networking capabilities as well. Um, the biggest thing for security on these is going to be the way it does user authentication through username and passwords, very stringent password policies, file permission control, and that user account management adhering to the principle of least privilege, meaning we only give them access to what they need and then they can elevate if needed. Um, additional security measures involve intrusion detection and prevention systems, which is those IDS, IPS I was talking about. Um, you also have file system encryption, secure shell or SSH, configuration, audit logs, and monitoring. Um, in most Windows systems, when we want to do remote management or remote access, we typically use something like RDP or remote desktop protocol. Um, you could also just use remote protocols or remote access calls. Um, in the Windows side, you obviously have PowerShell. PowerShell was a great addition on the Windows side to compete with some of the stuff that we were able to do on the Linux side. The file system security can be illustrated through a practical scenario of setting file permissions using the chmod command. Um, you can do this in the GUI of a Windows side, and you can enforce some strong password policies to enhance the user authentication and authorization. How many of you guys have used Linux in your day-to-day -day life? I mean, I have it dual booting on my laptop, but I don't really, I wouldn't say I would use it day to day. Gotcha. Jason, Tiffany? I definitely haven't had any real experience with it other than trying to work with it a little bit this past summer. Okay. So one of the, the main things I can say here is definitely, I, I know Windows is our go-to and that's what we've done, but really try to daily drive Linux for a while. And the reason I say that is in this industry, cybersecurity especially, you guys um, will be using Linux a lot, um, mostly from the back ends, the testing, the servering, um, the security side of things, almost everything's using Linux as a back end. Um, Windows is important because, you know, there's only so many servers in a network and there's a whole lot of end user machines and those are not typically Linux. So um, the Windows side is definitely nice uh, for most people to know, but the Linux side, that's usually where people struggle. And I'll be honest, the only way you know is just by driving it, by using it uh, day in, day out, figuring out how it works. Thankfully, it's fairly forgiving and it will pick up. There's lots of resources we have available to you if you struggle. Um, most of the stuff you're going to see in this course is going to be on the Linux side. Um, there will obviously be Windows because, again, we need to know it, um, but most people will struggle on the Linux side. All right. So from a web application standard, um, hopefully some of you have actually taken a little bit of this. This might be like my 601 class where I teach uh, advanced Python, um, et cetera. But a web application fundamental is just going to cover a broad topic but focus on the essential parts that you guys need to know for exposing yourself on the web applications for cyber threats. So you typically have this client server architecture. It's fundamental to all web apps. And it consists of the client, the user facing piece and the server, which is the backend. It enables modular and scalable development and the client's responsible for the GUI and the local processing um, where the server is just acting uh, server processes on the backside. Um, it involves client requests, triggering those server processes, data retrieval, manipulation of everything, the response generation, and then sending it back out to the client. So you guys have used this time and time again. Browse out to the internet, go to google.com. Google crunches your server request, gives you back the website, but what you actually see on the screen is generated from the client itself. Um, what we would need to know is HTTP and HTTPS are those fundamental web communications. HTTP is connectionless and has a request response cycle. HTTPS is a secure and encrypted communication using TLS SSL with benefits like data confidentiality, integrity, authentication, and enhanced trustworthiness. In HTTP, you're also going to have your main methods, and we're going to play with these quite a bit. 
You have your get in which we retrieve information, a post in which case we're going to send data. This is typically like a form. For example, think logging into a website, you are generating a post. You have put in which case you are sending file um, and delete as in there as well. And then while those headers provide some kind of metadata going through there. HTTPS is going to use the digital certificate architecture for server authentication, encryption keys, and a secure handshake, enhancing that data security and user trust. The adoption of HTTPS is crucial for safeguarding. Almost everything these days is HTTPS. Um, HTTP is quickly dropping out of favor. You know, if you log in with usernames and passwords in HTTP, it's clear text. We can literally just watch it go across the wire um, and, and be able to capture that information. Um, that doesn't mean HTTPS is, you know, 100% secure. Um, you have bad certificates that are out there. We could also do man in the middle attacks for SSL. It's a little harder. Um, there's some, a lot of trust mechanisms that have to be in place as a SOC, what you guys will see, um, for example, even in my, uh, firewalls course, where we do man in the middle and SSL injection. Um, so what we do is pretend that we have the certificate. We have to send self-signed certificates out to the client host, but we can even sniff SSL traffic at that point. And that's important for us as a SOC to see what's going across the network. A lot of people will encrypt traffic to go over 443 that isn't you know, web traffic. It could be other application traffic and other things that just, Normally, we would have to let go through our firewalls because we need HTTPS to go out. Um, but more and more threat actors are using that tunnel in order to traffic things that would normally be blocked by a firewall. All right. And then one of the last things that we're going to cover here is our information security standards and laws and acts. These are important for you guys to know. Um, it'll be in the quiz that pops up in there. Um, so information security standards, laws, and acts are crucial parts of what we do. Um, there is actually, if you look at our majors and the masters, you have the cybersecurity realm and you have the information insurance realm. Um, and it's so big because cybersecurity is such a wide gamut and wide topic that I have the people that do the technical side. And then I have the people that actually do the law policy and governance side. And right now those people make the exact same amount of money out in industry um, because those jobs are so much needed. It's not just what can you break into a system? It's what policies and governance and laws did you have in front of that to make sure that wasn't gonna happen in the first place. So the goal here is to protect that sensitive information, emphasize the confidentiality, integrity and availability Note, that is called the CIA triad. Um, nope, not the Central Intelligence Agency. It is the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So you guys will need to know that. That'll be some of the stuff um, that you'll get quizzed over there. Individual privacy there as well. So some big uh, topics in that realm. We have the Network and Information Systems Derivative from the UU, which focuses on enhancing cybersecurity posture of critical infrastructure operators and digital service op providers, emphasizing incident reporting and security measures. The Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act in the United States encourages the sharing of cybersecurity threat information between the government and private entities, providing liability protection for that. You also have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. You guys may know that as HIPAA. Um, it is a US law addressing the security and privacy of health data with components like the security rule and privacy rule. Um, going back at the top there, you have ISO 27001. This is a huge one that you guys will get quizzed on. Um, it's the internationally recognized standard for establishing and maintaining information security management systems, focusing on what risk management is, security controls, and continuous improvement. You also have NIST 853, this is published by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, AKA NIST, and provides security and privacy controls for federal information systems, including control families and baseline configurations. Most companies these days are trying to enlist to the, are aligned to the NIST framework. So you really, it becomes part of your job is making sure that you match the NIST standard. 
And one of the more recent ones that's come out is the GDPR, which is the uh, General Data Protection Regulation. And it's a comprehensive policy regulation in the European Union that grants individuals control over their personal data and imposes obligations to organizations of handling that data. If any of you have been browsing the web in the last five years, six years uh, since GDPR has come out, you'll notice that you constantly have a pop-up that asks about your cookies and whether or not you want to allow all the cookies, only the necessary cookies, or reject all cookies. That all came about because of GDPR, all right? So, and you guys have noticed that if you browse the internet lately, it completely changed the way the internet's out there. You now have a pop-up every single time you go to a window or to a website. All right. So to recap, there's a lot there and you guys will be able to read this inside that PDF, the actual hands-on or the, the reading material of that. Um, just remember that the computer networks are interconnected devices and communicate and share resources, forming the backbone. Understand the TCP IP model and the OSI model, where they interleave with one another and how they help traffic data across the network with TCP IP focusing on the implementation and the OSI model focusing on conceptual organization. Network types of LAN, WAN, MAN, and anybody remember the other one? Starts with a P. PAN. <laughs> I was about to guess that. <laughs> you have PAN, which is used to categorize networks uh, on a geographic scale, while network topologies such as your bus, star, ring, um, mesh, full mesh, etc. Uh, describe the physical and logical arrangement of those devices and connections on the network. Network hardware components such as your routers, switches, cables, etc. Those who facilitate your data transmission while network security controls such as policies and access controls along with devices such as firewalls and IDS, IPS protect the network from unauthorized threats and access. Both your Linux, Unix, and Windows offer security features for file permissions, access controls, firewalls, encryption, but they both differ in the implementation process and the specific vulnerabilities accepted for that. They used to say nobody writes a virus for Linux, right? Um, and I would say that's false these days, mostly because the proliferation of Linux and Unix being out there, it's like nobody writes a Mac for, you know, nobody writes a virus for Macs. That's because nobody likes Macs, but that's a personal opinion. Um, just kidding. They, they don't have the user base. And so when attacks and threats come out there from outside world, you, you know, the, the attackers want to write code that was going to get them to their end result, whatever they're trying to consume. And so whatever the vast majority of desktops and users out there, those are the ones that they try to attack. Um, that's why you see Windows as the, quote, most vulnerable out there. Well, it's just because it's the most prevalent out there. If you get into the Linux and Unix side of things, you'll also notice that when those viruses do hit, they hit hard and they can take down a lot of services, mostly because on the server side, you're going to see the Linux, Unix side of things. Um, however, there's plenty of Windows servers out there. For example, going back to that CrowdStrike example, that was a huge reason and showed you how many different industries in the world utilize Windows servers in that case. And then web application fundamentals, um, basically just addressing how web-based systems are built um, with information security standards such as ISO 27001, the NIST 853, um, and then laws such as HIPAA and GDPR and how those act to establish guidelines and protect us against sensitive data. So you'll kind of want to memorize these numbers. It'll roll off your tongue here before long. Um, but those will all be important, not just in this class, but out in industry. All right. That was a lot of material in a short amount of time. Um, for this week, all you're going to have is the PowerPoint and reading this module. Um, we can take it a, a little slower in here. And again, I'll get you access to, um, the deep links for purchasing, but right now you're, it's not setting anybody back. You have access to the PDF for the, uh, actual reading and you have access to the, um, the labs when they come up, there's no labs in, in module one.
Anybody have any questions about the course or the material? All right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.